Okay, good morning everybody. Yeah, it's quite a big panel, so we're trying to just make it a bit cosier, as it's a bit of a chat. Right, everybody okay? <laughs> Brilliant. Well, good morning everybody, and um, it was good to meet so many of you yesterday evening as well. What a good night that was, really, really good fun. So, as Michelle said, I'm Lynn Hughes of uh, Wanderlust magazine. Um, I got a HR notification this morning that my 30th anniversary with the business is next week, 6th of April. <laughs> so, um, yes, it, it was founded by myself and my late husband 30 years ago. And if you haven't seen the magazine, this is Wanderlust, and we are now officially the best-selling travel magazine in the UK. So, I thought what I'd do is we've got quite a big panel. I know uh, you would have been told who everybody is, but I thought we would just um, get everybody to quickly introduce themselves uh, so you can put names to faces and so on. So, Owen, let's hear with you, uh, start with you. Who are you? <laughs> and uh, congratulations. So you don't look a day over 29 years in the business. Yeah. I started very young, very young. <laughs> Okay, our own car is my name. Welcome to Boston. We regard Boston, I'm from Ireland, we regard Boston as our 33rd county. So I'm welcoming you all <laughs> to uh, part of uh, Ireland here today. Why Ireland? Um, a pretty, it's a, not the biggest population in the world, 6.4 million, but we are the biggest spend. We have the biggest per head spend. The cruise companies uh, track us as travellers. We're also incredibly well travelled. It's between ourselves and Norway as to who takes the most international visits uh, per capita in the world. We're also hugely familiar with this region. We have at least 300 million cousins in uh, <laughs> and we come over for their weddings, christenings, everything like that. We're also great dispersers. This is really important because um, while we will congregate in Boston and uh, we will also end up in the small towns, the small villages, those wonderful places that are exhibiting in there. What I do is I do a magazine for the trade in Ireland. I also do a broadcast to the consumer in Ireland and I look forward to talking to all of you about how we can bring more Irish people into Boston. And how many, sorry, before we move on, how many uh, radio interviews have you done today so far? Uh, th just three today. <laughs> and the way the time difference does, the, the peak drive time show in Ireland is, coincides with three o'clock in the morning in Boston. <laughs> Yeah, so if Owen looks tired, and you don't, by the way, I mean, you actually look really good, but if Owen looks tired, yes, he was doing radio interviews at 3 a.m. this morning. And I think uh, it probably is important to remember as well that as well as, you know, print journalism, online journalism, you know, these days it's also all about the radio, the TV, the social channels, the podcasts, uh, just so many platforms and channels now. Anyway, welcome Patricia. Hi everybody, I am Patricia Miranda and I am editor-in-chief of Reforma newspaper, uh, the travel section um, since 18 years ago. And I don't, I, do I have to talk about that? No, we'll come, okay. we'll, I think we'll come back to that, yes. <laughs> Let's just meet everybody first. Thank you. You see, the Irish always talk the most. <laughs> it's a national stereotype we have to do. And also sing before the end of the session. <laughs> oh, we look forward to that. Yeah, that's why we've got a spare mic over there. Right, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Jenny Southern. I'm the editor, founder, and CEO of Globe Trender, which is a travel trend forecasting agency in the UK. Um, and we also have an online magazine um, which looks at the future of travel. So uh, if you visit our site, you'll find uh, trend reports that you can download for free. Um, you, we do a couple of newsletters, one's an, a weekly innovation briefing, which is also free, uh, which gives you lots of interesting insights into what's cool and cutting edge and coming next. And we also have a premium newsletter called Vault, which uh, is designed for travel professionals um, and provides um, uh, in-depth trend reports on a weekly basis um, and I'm also a freelance journalist uh, I write for lots of different publications but uh, some of the big ones include The Telegraph and Condé Nast Traveller. Thanks Jenny. Zoe. Hello my name's Zoe Gotto I'm a British journalist and author I've written two books one on a very famous American Elvis Presley um, and the other was on vintage fashion 
I've also been freelance for about 12 years now. Um, and my main outlet is National Geographic Traveller, but I also write for all sorts of publications. Condé Nast Traveller, Lonely Planet, um, The Telegraph, The Times. In America, I write for Hemispheres and Fodas. Um, and my specialist area is the US. So I'm over here at the moment. I'm over here on a monthly basis. Yeah, so Zoe, just before we go to Holger, but have you been to New England before? I have, yes. This is my second time um, since October. So I came over, I was doing a piece in the autumn which was about um, the lighthouse trail along the coast of New England and I wrote yeah. that for the Times. So, yes, return visit. Yeah, brilliant. Holger. Yeah, good morning, my name is Holger Jacobs. Uh, I've been with FEW Media Group for almost 30 years now, it's 29 years to be precise, and I've been doing the North America coverage for almost a, uh, the same time. And my special connection to New England is I used to have a girlfriend in Bedford, Massachusetts, <laughs> close to here. <laughs> when I say I used to, you know what, how it ended, but my, but my, but my, but my, but my, but my really close relationship and my really my love to for New England has never never faded and so um, I'm glad to be here and F, just to give you an idea FEW Media Group is the largest travel trade media house in Germany so we are, we are doing print we're doing digital and of course we are organizing a lot of travel trade related events such as fam tours uh, congresses conventions or whatever. Mm. And so, Holger, you specialise, I believe, in North America. Have you been to New England before? Is this, have you been here many times? Well, yeah, as I, as I, as I had a girlfriend here, yes. Uh, well, of course, sorry, yeah, I'm yes, being thick. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, still, some, I'm still broken-hearted at the story. <laughs> so, <laughs> several yeah. times, yes. But, you know, you don't feel any pain coming back. Not at all, not at all. <laughs> my, 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 my love for the New England is never going to fade. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, Owen, you've, um, you've already touched a bit on the, the Irish traveller, um, and we did hear this morning, those have been in the other sessions, about how um, travel from Ireland is booming. It's, it's the biggest growth, isn't it? So, what is it about here and about the Irish traveller? It's um, a particular love for... Um the whole of North America, but those are the, the three or four corners that we have uh, great affection with. We're familiar with it. We grow up with it. It's like it's the next parish after the Dingle Peninsula going west. <laughs> and we are, um, it always comes back then to something else, and the something else is the access. Um, the number, we, we had a little bit of uh, attempts to get back into America in big numbers. But uh, access was a huge problem because America was supposed to open up on, in September of uh, 2021. It didn't open up to well into November. And it took a little bit of while to get the wheels into motion. But uh, our, we've got a good variety of uh, aviation routes into North America. We've something like 20 uh, separate routes from Dublin Airport and two of them come into this region, Hartford, Connecticut, which you can't forget, an Aer Lingus route, but also that Delta and uh, Aer Lingus flying directly into Boston, and we have two airports coming in. So we have this uh, desire for travel. I'd also extend it to the general European Union. You can see the, the trends that came up earlier on that Spain was a good um, grower, and yeah. uh, that's a very important because during the pandemic, the South American routes, that are, that's the treasury of Iberia, is the South American services, and with TAP in Portugal, and now Lisbon and Madrid are directly connected, and uh, Peter will talk more about the direct connections to Frankfurt and Munich, but we are, Boston is an incredibly well connected city with Europe, and that's because of geography, the huge advantage of its geography. Yeah, yeah. Really. Um, Patricia, now Mexico, the, the figures were quite small, but we could see it was there on the charts and, and growing. It's growing, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and I think a lot of people may not have thought of Mexico as a market. Okay. So, who is your reader? Uh, the profile of our readers, they are um, travellers that uh, 
already visited the typical destinations in the United States, you know, like uh, Florida, Texas, and in the South, and nowadays they are looking for new experiences, especially um, because they, are, they have a, a high economical power, and they are very interested in have a gastronomical uh, wine experiences, and, and they love sports, such as uh, they want to go to the marathon. It doesn't matter if they are not going to run. They want to see the marathon. <laughs> oh. our, I, I have to be honest, our uh, national sport is shopping. <laughs> we are crazy about shopping, but also we love baseball and, and the, the race cars and baseball, uh, football, soccer, oh. and especially they are looking as well for a medical uh, tourism. Okay. Oh yeah, uh, they spend a lot of money and go to to see the tra treatments, the best treatments. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if for is if is for health or for um, um, how do you say that? Oh, um, the, the, wellness. The, the wellness. Or, yeah. oh, wellness Cosmetic. Is, yeah. yeah, wellness is another um, very high opportunity. Mm -hmm. And after the pandemic, um, they start to to change the mind. Now they want to drive the, this kind of American dream, uh, the, drive the RV cars and go to do some trekking and glamping and uh, looking for the very high hotels to practice the pleasure travel, but also they want to, to, to stay at the little cottages, uh, hotel boutiques, um, rent a house, to, just to have the experience to to be um, like an insider, walking around neighborhood, uh, visit the, the biggest mall, but also the little the little stores, you know, yeah. in which you can buy the typical of one destination. Uh, also, our readers ha has a, have a very high cultural level, so they want to go to the concerts, uh, opera houses, um, golf courses, you, you know, uh, it's a, they want to have a unique experience. So I'm very happy to be here because it's the first time that uh, this part of the United States invite to one media. Um, Reforma um, is one of the most important and, and we have a, the weekly publication. We appear on Sundays and I'm very happy to come back and write histories about this experience in order to send you a lot of Mexican travelers and eat your great food, but especially because we love to walk on the cities and I, I, my, my experience yesterday is, is very, was very uh, great because I saw a lot of architecture. You are walking and you listen to music. It's a very clean destination. Yeah. All the time you feel comfortable. We have a honeymooners, uh, and I think it's a great destination for a honeymoon, but also we have a multi-generational families because we always uh, used to travel together. Like we say like a muegano families, which is like a candy, all together to the restaurant, all together to walk, and, and it seems, uh, from the grandparents to the, to the little kids. And also it's a great destination for uh, this woman who wants to, uh, to travel, like they call it the solo travel. Solo yeah, travel because well, yeah. in every single moment you feel comfortable and safe, yes. and that is very important. Yeah. That's, I think that's, so, it's all. Oh, really, really interesting. That's a great insight because I think you know a lot of us haven't really thought about the Mexican market, but yeah. um, sounds a really good match for this destination, what they're looking for. So, Holger, we'll go over to you. Um, how is the German traveller doing post-pandemic? And, um, yeah, I mean, again, you, know, you are, I think, the biggest market after the UK coming here. So, what's happening? Generally spoken, the, the German German market has recovered very well. So, uh, for a lot of destinations, uh, for outbound travel to a lot of destinations from Germany, we all, uh, already see that even the visitor volumes um, will be at pre-pandemic levels in this year. So, this is really so we are back to normal, so to say. Um, last year, we were looking at about 80 to 82 uh, 82 percent. Um, 
and of course, depending on the destination, so there were some medium haul destinations around the Mediterranean who have already fully recovered. And of course, the long haul destinations such, such as North America, uh, there wasn't enough time to fully recover. So for, for example, the US, uh, we were looking at, at the US, we were looking at about 72% of the visitor volume which we had pre-pandemic in 2019. So, and which, which is both leisure and, uh, and, and visiting French relatives and business travel. And as we already heard today, of course, Business travel is recovering, now, now it's catching up, but it has recovered more slowly. So leisure travel is back, is, to the US is back, to New England is back, uh, as there is a lot of, there's still a lot of pent up demand. Um, there's a trend towards longer trips. So um, the average trip to the US used to be from Germany, it used to be about two weeks, and now we're looking at 17, 18, 19 days. So people try to pack more experience into the trip. Um, of course, the people are people are, are willing to spend more money, and they have to spend more money. You all know that traveling, not only to the U.S. but particularly to the U.S., has become way more expensive. So we are not only talking about airfares, who are still I think in a kind of a reasonable range, but we're talking about rental cars, accommodation, um, attractions, um, also the not very favorable at, at this time um, exchange rate between the euro and, and the dollar. So this is kind of an obstacle, this is kind of something we have to keep an eye on. Um, but still, last year, 70, as I said, 72%, so we were looking at about 1.5 million Germans uh, going to the US, uh, pre-pandemic was two, almost 2.3 million, and we are pretty confident that we'll be back to, we'll be back to um, pre-pandemic levels um, in 2024, um, that there's a fair, ch fair chance for that. But as I said, um, I think the price point is something we have to keep an eye on, um, and uh, that this is maybe not particularly important for New England, other, other than, for example, for a typical family destinations such as Florida. But still, I think that's something you always um, have to remind that, that there's that, that there, there's a certain there's a certain limit where people try to where people might not gonna take their travel decision in favor of New England when, it get, when it's getting too expensive. Mm. And Holger, you mentioned the uh, longer duration though that people are staying and, and that seems to be a trend with British traveller that we've seen as well. Um, is the, um, one of the presentations earlier was touched on about leisure, combining business and leisure and also in the UK, um, workation has become a bit of a, a phrase where people perhaps work overseas with, now that it's much more flexible working. So they'll actually work some of the days they're away. Is, has that been a trend in Germany at all? That's been a trend in Germany as well, yes. Uh, although we always have to um, keep in mind um, how, how big is the trend and how relevant is the trend if you're looking at the whole market. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, we know a lot of examples of people working remote com uh, or, and or combining business and leisure. Mm -hmm. um, for example, going to a travel trade fair or to a Discover New England summit and then maybe adding a few private days, private, uh, uh, private leisure days. Um, so, yeah, I'd, the question is, is from, from a German perspective, would New England be the, the perfect destination for that? Uh, I'd say it's more, um, it's something which is, from the German perspective, which is a trend within Europe, that for example, um, Germans go to Portugal or go to Spain or to Italy where there's no or only one hour time difference and uh, spend their, their pleasure time there or, or working from remote from there. Um, other than that, um, I don't think it's such a major trend that it's, from the German perspective, is really relevant for New England. Okay. Uh, well, uh, mullet travel is what the New York Times called it in their uh, travel trends for 2023, mm. wherever they got that. The mullet, to me, mm. is an appalling uh, haircut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Well, um, looking at trends, Jenny, 
Um, what are some, you know, one or two of the key trends that you're picking up on a Globe Trender? Um, yeah, so obviously this is our area of expertise. Um, in our 2023 forecast that we published at the beginning of this year, uh, we focused on 10 trends that were of particular significance for this year. And our number one trend was China boom. Now, of course, we know that um, out inbound and outbound travel from China um, has restarted this year and is going to be hugely significant uh, globally. Um, before the pandemic, China um, was the biggest source market for tourism uh, by a long way globally. So it will be really, really interesting to see how this takes off again. Um, and for destinations um, and hospitality companies to really think about how to make Chinese travelers feel welcome. Um, other trends uh, that we've coined include rebel spending. Now, this refers to how people are defiantly spending still on travel, even though there's a cost of living crisis and economic, serious economic challenges in many countries at the moment. But travel really does remain a top priority for many people if they can afford it. So middle classes and high earners particularly, of course. Um, Low cost, low season travel, uh, I think, is an interesting one. As uh, tourism, uh, you know, returns, we have also the return of over tourism to certain destinations, as was being talked about in a previous session this morning. And I think uh, it's interesting to think about, um, yeah, travel off season and to, to destinations such as New England that really do offer a lot all all year round uh, for travellers, and to really capitalise on that. Um, indigenous appreciation, I think, is a really, really interesting new emerging trend, very important one, uh, whereby destinations are working much more closely and respectfully with Native um, and First Nations peoples. Um, life hacking retreats, this is uh, an aspect, uh, trend within the wider transformational travel trend. So this is travel that changes you in some way, travel that helps you become a better person, and it's quite closely linked with wellness, um, tourism. Um, a couple of other trends, drycations or sober travel, uh, not drinking alcohol has become quite a big trend in the UK, that believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, it really has. Um, people are much more health conscious, health is the new wealth, and with that is, is coming uh, some level of sobriety among people, and people are looking to uh, feel better, I think, after their holidays rather than worse. Um, <laughs> and finally, modern family travel. Um, some interesting statistics from a UK perspective. Um, about 20% of families in the UK um, uh, and now have kids raised by a solo parent. Um, and there's about a quarter of a million families in the UK um, headed up by same-sex parents, and I'm one of them. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about how to, you know, how think about the family of today. It's not necessarily a nuclear family with a mum, dad, and 2.4 children. Um, families, of course, are very, very diverse, and making sure that people feel welcome to come to a place with their kids is a huge opportunity and very, very important. Um, I think, just quickly, a few trends that are relevant, I think, to this destination. Mm particularly that I was thinking about, would be um, <clears throat> wilderness seeking, athletic adventures, electric road trips. So this is, you know, just on the horizon, really, the, with the range of electric cars now uh, improving and charging point uh, distribution improving, um, you know, we'll see the ability to, to travel longer distances by road. Um, in electric vehicles. I think that's a really, really interesting one. Um, clean air tourism. Um, so many destinations globally, especially urban destinations, are suffering from terrible pollution. And uh, you know, being able to retreat to somewhere for a holiday where you can just breathe crisp, fresh air, believe it or not, is going to be a big USP. Um, and finally, limelight locations. Um, this is a trend that we coined to describe um, 
the power that TV shows and movies have to inspire people to travel to places. And I think this is going to be a massive trend. If anyone's watched White Lotus, for example, you know the power of that show to have inspired travel to uh, Sicily recently, for example. So there's a lot that can be talked about that. But yeah, that's, that's a little overview. Yeah, at the, in the UK at the moment, a uh, race across the world started yeah. again last week, third series. Uh, this is a reality show where um, lots of, I'd say couples, um, <laughs> where they're not necessarily a couple um, in that way. There might be a father and daughter, for instance, or a pair of friends, um, go from cover a huge distance on a budget of just £50 a day each. And uh, so uh, it was a huge success during the pandemic. The latest one started last week and um, it's going all the way across Canada. And I saw somebody from Destination Canada uh, a couple of days before I came away, Monday, and she said the spike in searches for Van Vancouver, Vancouver Island, Hyde Gwaii, even though people couldn't spell it, um, and everything because the first series focused on that. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so um, this huge, huge demand all of a sudden from people seeing this on their television screens. It's incredible. Before we move on to anybody else on trends, I just want to pick up on what you said about the modern family, though. I find that really interesting. So, as you say, so um, I know you've got a wife, I know you've got a daughter. How has travel changed for you since you've had a daughter? Yeah, it's a good question and something I didn't really anticipate because when I travelled with my wife previously, uh, we'd, we'd just go anywhere in the world more or less. We weren't particularly worried about specific laws uh, against LGBTQ plus travellers. We'd moderate our behaviour, you know, in public as necessary. Um, but beyond that, we didn't worry a great deal. Um, but it's very different travelling with a child, uh, especially a four-year-old who outs you all the time, saying, <laughs> Mummy, Mama, you know, and, and there's no hiding it. So I definitely put a lot more thought into where we go on holiday. And I really want to make sure we'll always all feel very comfortable in just being who we are uh, in that place. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, we might well come back to that. Um, Zoe, so as a, uh, a freelance journalist and author, what are you seeing as a trend? So, for instance, you know, what, what is in demand at the moment? What are the editors looking for? Um, I feel, in the UK at least, that there's a real appetite at the moment for stories from people who have historically been underrepresented. So I'm kind of doing a roaring trade at the moment in female-led stories. So I've just been over in Arizona and I was covering an all-female rodeo. Um, I was doing that for Suitcase. Um, but I've also I've got a piece coming out in Condé Nast Traveller next month, which is about um, an anti-racist coffee movement that's helping communities in Memphis. Um, I've just been asked to do a piece for The Times, which is about indigenous travel in the Dakotas. So I feel like there's... I don't know, just a real kind of hunger for kind of untold or lesser told stories of people. Uh, so actually, that, that really resonates uh, with us at Wanderlust because we've always tried to focus uh, quite a bit on local people and local stories. Um, but if, because we are now getting more feedback on that, we are doing that to an even greater degree. So it might, sometimes it's obviously indigenous, um, but it'll just be featuring local people. The photos that we show of people will be local people. We take tips and stories from local people um, because we find that that's what people want to do when we ask them about their travels. Um, it's, and I think even particularly so since the pandemic, they want to go out and meet local people um, like Patricia, you mentioned about going into not just the big shopping malls, but going into the small shops. The yeah, I think going into the small shops, the family owned restaurants, the guest houses. Do you think as well people want that interaction? Yeah. And also, the travelers want to have a real experience. 
if I don't know if you go to it's for an example if you go to Cancun of course you want to go to the to the pool and the sea but also you want to 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 be in touch with the Mayan people and probably go to the little houses in the middle of the jungle and learn how to do the tortillas. Yeah. And if one Mexican come here, they want to go to the with the fishermen or to the local restaurant and go inside the kitchen, you know? Yeah. They want to, to sit in the table of the very fancy restaurant, but also uh, nowadays the traveler want, want, want to know, wants to know which is behind these scenes, you yeah. know? Um, having touch with the, the, with the people. Yesterday I was looking for the biggest, the, the market, the local market, you yeah. know? Because uh, you want to, to, to be an insider. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a great way to put it. They want to be an insider, definitely. Um, but talking of which, oh, and yesterday afternoon, Zoe and I went to an Irish bar in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It wasn't quite where I expected to spend my first afternoon ever in Boston. How could you find an Irish bar in Boston? <laughs> very rare. Yeah, Irish bars are, uh, are all over the world. Irish people regard them with a little bit of, um, you know, I will never go to an Irish bar when I'm abroad, and then they end up going anyway. Uh, they, because they reflect more the city you're in. And the Irish bar, the most southernmost bar in the world, in Ushuaia, in Argentina, is an Irish bar with penguins painted on. But it doesn't really reflect anything to do with Ireland. It's all about Antarctic culture. So Irish bars reflect the local city that you go to more often than earlier. <laughs> but you're asking about trends. Yeah. Um, the most important thing I'm going to say here today, and it's for this audience specifically, is you guys have come through a pandemic. It's been post-traumatic stress for a lot of us. But you've had a very strong domestic market, as many places around the world have, to fill the gaps. Don't count on it. Look back to international travel. Look back to uh, the things that, that the changes since the pandemic in international travel, which have already been outlined. The increased spend. A lot of people have three years of holidays to spend in one now and the longer stay. I have a couple of figures which uh, I'm going to put up from the European side because we looked at very good aviation figures from the American side this morning. And the, uh, AU, the main European aviation, I include British Airways here in IAG because they're now a Spanish-owned company, that shows you the, the, the competition between the major European airlines and the huge, the, the slowness of the recovery that's compared to 2019. Lufthansa is only 70%, IAG only 80%, Air France has come back to close to 80%. What we're looking at for the first half of this year is inflation is, is going to make that booking a little bit slower, business travel really, really strong, and conference travel slower, slower uh, business travel and group travel and, and conference travel slower to come back. Leisure demand, uh, is where it's, it's, it's holding out, but your biggest problem for uh, leisure demand is the dollar. The dollar is roaring ahead, and the surveys done by SDR Global show that 60% uh, of people in Europe are now worried about traveling to America because of value for money. How do you counter that? There are two ways of countering that. The first one is the airlines have got to play their part. They've got to put really, really good low fares into place. That's what Welling and Aer Lingus are doing within the IAG group. And you also have to watch your prices on the ground. The, you know, work the specials, get to pay, try and display. It's a, it all, this serves as an advantage for people getting out of Boston as a major city, which is going to be more expensive. Costs are higher. And play up as a region as a series of true tourism and communities here, how getting out of the big cities will make your money go further. Price is going to have to be a weapon to persuade Europeans to travel in the numbers that you do. But when you get them back, they are spending more, staying longer, and it's a, the prize is worth working for. Marketing will do it, access is more important. The availability of beds is more important. All of that fit is coming together. Is what out of this few days we're having spending together uh, should be 
should be a big take takeaway point. The international market is hugely important for this region in a way it isn't for other parts of the United States because of your tr triumph of geography. A, a flight from Ireland is the same uh, distance as a flight to the Canary Islands or to uh, Cyprus for us. So you are almost European in the way is I made the joke about Ireland, about Boston being the 33rd county. You are almost European in the same way we in Ireland are almost American. So that's the big point I'd make about the trends that are there. And the big danger is that price. And the, it's not your fault, it's the way the dollar, but that's not going back anyway soon because of the war, because of all the other things. The dollar is going to be strong for the next couple of years. We've got to live with it and we've got to work, get a work around for it. Totally, really good point there. And I think, for me, one of the takeaways from this morning with the Expedia presentation was that phrase about perceived value. And this is it. I think people are spending more, as we've said, you know, so they're travelling in premium economy, premium class, despite the incredible price of airfares at the moment. They've really shot up. At 40%. 40% up, yeah, it's scary. And yet, premium is full, and the economy isn't, because I think it's still that kind of rebound travel, revenge travel, you know, we deserve to be travelling again. They want, to, um, they want to go and have an incredible travel experience, despite the cost of living crisis. They want to spend longer. So it does, a lot of it does come down to perceived value that they are getting lifetime memories, that they are getting experiences they don't get at home that are very different to home, but at the same time feel perhaps familiar enough that they feel safe and comfortable with them. Um, so, yeah, definitely something to think about. It will be a big focus, I think, for the next two years. The, the other huge advantage, Americans sometimes get jumpy about culture because, you know, 400 years is a big deal here. It isn't in Europe. But the two great cultural triumphs of Mexico. North America, I know, the, the two great triumphs of the United States culturally are the film industry and the music industry. And um, while I've been to countries where they say we're having a big movie made this year and it's going to do wonders for our tourism, this is a weekly event for you guys. You know, the cheers, culture, all of that. It's a, it's a, we have grown up watching American television and American film and listening to American music. So you have a culture that the rest of the world looks up to and wants to come here and experience it firsthand. And when we come, and this isn't an international tourist experience in everywhere we go, but when we come to America, it's authentic. It isn't a jazz band that's been gathered up and brought in for the tourists. It's something that they do every Saturday night. So that's your big win-win-win. And you, you know, you probably take it for granted because this is your homeland. This is where you grew up. This is the country, your own uh, home uh, people. But it's something that you should stress again and again and again. You have this amazing culture that we all want to come and experience, and it's genuine. And the one thing that's crumbling, and the internet age when Wikipedia and TripAdvisor and everything is authenticity. If you've got it, play it up, stress it again and again. Yeah, brilliant point. Okay, Holger, what about you? And anything to add to that? I, I would like to, yes, uh, because you, you mentioned that uh, the Amer Americans tend to be ashamed of their short history, and I'd say, I, I'd see it a bit, I, I, I understand that, but from a, from a German perspective, uh, Germans love to explore your history because you have a very living history. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of connection, especially here in New England. This is a, a, a history which is very closely connected to Europe, of course, because of the, the, the early settlers coming here. Uh, and so that's, that's always uh, a, a benefit uh, for, for Germans. So, so they, they have a, there's a kind of a relationship when you're traveling uh, to New England. Um, and you, Moreover, it's, 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 it's the, whole, the whole setting, it's the architecture. If you're going through to Boston, uh, you, I think it, it, Boston combines European and, and, and US features and, and the, the positive features of, of, of both destinations. And moreover, your history is really, from my point of view, from the German point of view, presented as a very living history. It's not something which is sealed somewhere 
behind glass a glass door of a cupboard or whatever. It's you you have you have those fantastic um, outdoor uh, museums uh, like, like such as Plymouth Plantation, for example. So there's um, there's such a great way for Germans who really love to explore. And we were talking about both authentic authentic experiences, ex authentic encounters with uh, indigenous people, with local people. But moreover, there's the, Germans also love to, to get into that history and to get a connection to that history and think your, your US and especially New England is a perfect example uh, how you make that possible. So I think that's a, that's a big benefit. Mm. And I do identify with the bit when you're fighting the English. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are then some of the opportunities for New England? Um, like Jenny, what about LGBTQ? Oh, I'm going to trip the words now. <laughs> I've got a good Queer solution. Travel. Yes. <laughs> queer travel. I think it's time to rebrand it. Um, it's you know, queer is a word that has been used as a derogatory slur uh, in the past, um, but the community uh, tends to use it now um, in a way that's empowering. Uh, it's being reclaimed. LGBTQIA is, is really hard to say and it's really long and actually queer is just quite a, re a nice shorthand for anyone who is not straight and not uh, cisgender so anyone who might be trans or non-binary so queer is a really nice simple catch-all term but I think people can start feel confident about using so um, you talked about that potentially being an opportunity for, for New England and I, I agree um, from what I understand, Boston has a, a great pride festival. Um, Provincetown, you know, is is the place to go. I'm I'm keen to visit. I haven't been yet. Um, you know, so it has it seem appears to be a very welcoming destination uh, for queer people, um, but it's not necessarily that well known outside of of the U.S. Um, and so I think there's a, a real opportunity to to let the world know about that and. Um, I was looking at some stats online about um, about queer travel, and Gay Times revealed that 60% uh, of, of queer, the queer community seeks out experiences such as Pride when away from home. Um, I know a lot of my friends make uh, a real effort to, to spend the summer traveling to different uh, Pride festivals um, and having you know loads of fun, meeting new people, quite a hedonistic kind of uh, few weeks. Um, and it's, it's a real highlight on the calendar. Um, and, you know, having said that, you know, when it comes to trip planning, uh, Gay Times, when they did this survey, recently found that um, almost 65% of people say they cannot find um, reliable travel information easily in one place about where's safe to go, where's good to go, um, you know, where, when searching for and planning a trip. Um, you know, laws and legislation, you know, in different parts of the world, you know, it changes. And you have to really do quite a lot of digging to really be sure, you know, to, be, to have information that's trustworthy. And so, you know, being front and centre, maybe having, you know, more dedicated pages on your websites, um, that clearly ex are really explicit in saying that we are welcoming, we are inclusive, you know, that will really go a long way and will show up hopefully in Google searches as well as people are typing in, you know, Boston Pride or LGBTQ travel, or queer travel, you know, it needs to show up in these Google searches. Um, and to also work with, you know, queer influencers, um, you know, get these stories in the press uh, that showcase all you have to offer um, as a destination. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's a huge opportunity. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of us out there, and a lot of us, you know, have disposable income. Uh, there are lots of queer families that want to, to know where to go on holiday. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, you can probably cater to a lot of those people. So, yeah. yeah. And picking up that point again about pages on a website, and that was mentioned earlier on today when talking about accessibility, about talking about sustainability. Um, I judge a set of sustainability awards 
and the number of um, organisations, uh, hotels and so on, that put in a, uh, they nominate themselves for the awards, and then when you look at their website, they have nothing on there about sustainability. Why not, you know, and why aren't they communicating that? Um, so, yeah, sometimes people are missing the most obvious thing for when people are researching their trip with this hard to spend money. Um, yeah, any um, other sort of other opportunities that you can see, Owen? Um, but every single uh, part of the travel, every single part of people's lived lives has a travel uh, outlet, a travel, the LGBT um, example is a very good one because, you know, if you isolate that as a group within travel, I think their average spend is a considerable percentage, I've seen different figures, above the average. So you can actually uh, target uh, all the areas, that the fishing, the golf, the, um, uh, uh, the family experience, it, um, and cha it, it, there, is, there is something in the great kaleidoscope of international travel with the different communities and the different type of people and the different type of personalities. For every single one of the communities in New England that are here today, uh, people I've heard, I've been here just 24 hours, I've heard conversations about small towns in Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire that I haven't even, don't even know where they are, and people's individual experience of having visited them. Every single one of you has a particular market that was completely suited to you. And the tools that we have nowadays with um, you know, direct access to those groups and those people, the motorcyclists, the cyclists, the walkers, the hikers, the particular, the, you know, fishermen is sort of put into a great big uh, lump a category in itself. It isn't a category. It's a category of 200 different types of fishermen. So every single, the access to these groups has never been better. And in a very converse and contradictory way, the homogenization of the message, come to New England, this is our video that we get all the five states in, works counter to that. We should actually be, be separating, dividing out what we have, what does, you know, what does, uh, it's, uh, the Europeans will have great difficulty even naming the states. They would uh, really have great difficulty working out what's the difference between Maine and Vermont. And what you've got to do, the challenge you guys face is, this is what we uniquely, as a state, as a region, as a culture, as a community have. And it's very, very easy to find that niche Somewhere else, people who will be really impressed by coming to you, because people go to the most appalling, unappealing places on holidays because it's trendy or it's marketing or it's on Instagram or whatever, and the most beautiful spots just over the mountain are being left behind. That's the opportunity and the challenge at the same time we have out of here. No, very true. And and it's, it's getting over that variety of images, you're right, because so much marketing collateral. And we've heard today, you know, about 10 second videos, <laughs> 10 second TikToks. And things get compressed and down into such a small thing. And of course, that is then very homogenous. It just shows one image. You know, Google New England and you see New England in the fall images okay. everywhere. <laughs> There are people who don't think New England exists outside of the fall. <laughs> I mean, and even the word fall doesn't work in Europe. Like fall no. is what happens when you're in the bar and you lean too far back in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the, the 12 months experience that we heard earlier on, the summer house in Maine and the winter experience and all of that, all of those aren't familiar to us because it's been subsumed by this massive single message marketing yeah. campaign. And that's no criticism of the single message because the world is a competition of 200 countries. But the opportunity to dissipate that and mm -hmm. focus it and chisel it down to your particular market, wherever it is, is there. Yeah, very much so. I don't even like skiing. I really don't like skiing. I don't like getting cold. But somebody <laughs> was telling me, and of course, and of course my uh, experience of skiing is going to busy ski resorts in Europe where you queue for a lift and you pay a fortune for everything, you queue for everything, 
you crash into people on the slopes, which of course, and they you and uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> which of course happens in North America as well. But somebody in the room who's a keen skier was telling me about she loves to come to New England for skiing because of the quiet because it's good for her soul, because it's beautiful. She sees wildlife, she doesn't have to queue. And I found myself entranced by this description. I thought, ooh, actually, you know, maybe being here in winter or skiing here would actually be a really beautiful, fulfilling experience. And, and I think, so that is, you know, it's a way of sometimes I think we all take for granted what's under our noses, but actually there's a way of thinking, well, who would that appeal to? How can that be twisted around? Because actually, I think if that was described to a lot of people in Britain, that, that type of skiing experience that you could have here, I think that would really attract people. I think you're right. Just to add, I think there's something to be said about kind of working with what you've got what makes your destination really unique. Um, for example, I went to Utah recently, and I went there because I was writing a story about the Mormon food culture and how it's kind of shifting at the moment and becoming more multicultural, and that is tagged to the Mormons going on missionaries and they're coming back with new partners from their host countries or a love of the food that they experienced elsewhere. So I was like, that's a really interesting story. And I was talking to... Um, the tourists thought about it and they said, historically, we've kind of not really tapped into um, the Mormon story, but we're starting to see that it really does appear. And I was saying to them, you know, Salt Lake City, that's your selling point. That's, you know, what you have that nowhere else has. And it's a really interesting story culturally. So I think sometimes what kind of makes you unique, it's right under your nose. and. Sometimes when you're too close to it, you don't always kind of quite see it. But from an outsider, someone coming from Europe to Salt Lake City, like it's absolutely fascinating what you have there. Yeah, so totally. It's so different have. to the experiences that we, we all are so used to. Um, Patricia, you mentioned about uh, Mexicans coming here uh, because of the interest in the sport. Yeah. And. Again, you know, I mean, I, I just find that really interesting. Just as well um, with the presentation this morning when they said about Brazil, the number of uh, visitors from Brazil come go up when the marathon's on, the Boston Marathon. Yeah. But, um, yeah, do, do Mexicans um, travel elsewhere for sport, or do you think it's particularly here? Uh, they, they are looking for the new experience, and the sports are very important, you know, and yeah. they, they don't... Mm, they don't care about uh, spend a lot of money, but because they want to to come back and say, oh, next year you have to go to see the marathon, you have to see uh, the, to feel the environment in one stadium because it's is uh, farther than the sports per se. It's the the experience, the yes. environment, okay. and yeah. of course um, you want to come back with your souvenir and and to the inspiration for the others. Yeah. And, and also I want to add that universities are very important. This exchange, the educational tourism, uh, all the time the families want to send the, the, the people from the high school. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is another uh, important okay, segment. Okay, so it's not just leisure travel then. There no, is, it's also it's a, yeah. the cultural. Education as well. Ed educational, yeah. 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 yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, Holger, um, have you noticed any, or do you think they're looking at opportunities again? Are there any sectors other than leisure, for instance, or anything else on opportunities-wise? I mean, you, you know New England very well. Well, sports is, is uh, of course, is one of the, of the trends. I mean, we've seen the first NFL a uh, match uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Munich, which was the Bucks against the Seahawks. Uh, you might have noticed that, and that was a, that was a big sell. I mean, it was, it was sold out within minutes, and yeah. it, was, uh, it, yeah. it was oversold uh, three, four ta three times, so it was amazing. So there is a lot of interest, especially among, uh, among younger people, uh, for American sports, and 
those 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 uh, Germans, of course, know that that Boston is one of the the, the if not the hub, but the, one of the biggest sports cities in the U.S. So, of course, this is an opportunity. Although I always have to uh, stress that sports might not be an. an Spectator sports might not be the main reason why they come here, but they like to include it in yeah. their in their um, package. I would I'd say a, a big trend, and we, we already mentioned it that that people love to stay longer. This also means um, people love to Germans love to have even more variety, love to explore, love to. So there's a big chance for what we we call the, the low season. Uh, 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 yeah. Travel, what we call the travel beyond the beyond the mainstream, beyond the hot hot spots. So, the, and and our, New England has lots to offer in that kind. And the question is, how could we sell this product to the German traveler? And I'd like to stress the role of the of the of the travel trade in general in that perspective, which is the receptive operators, the two operators, the travel agents, and of course all your, your, your marketing and sales entities such as the Discover New England, such as the state travel organizations, and also as, as regards Brand USA. So what we've seen um, during the pandemic and also right after the, the pandemic faded and after the borders reopened, there was a very strong tendency in long haul travel, especially to the US, um, as regards um, that, that, that these, all these organizations and the, those companies and entities, that they strongly, very strongly and successfully promoted the US. And uh, that sales revenues went up uh, very, very, very heavily. And I think that is something which we always have to take into account when we think about how to market your destination and how to how to develop the sales. So I think that's something which we, which is really important. Yeah. Something that's very obvious to everyone on the stage, and might be obvious to everyone in the room, is the scale of holidays that's available to Europeans. Six weeks would yeah. not be unusual in the year. So the off season holiday is not the main, doesn't need to be the main holiday. America has a tradition of being the main holiday of the year for Europeans. With the increased access I talked about earlier, you could actually shell, sell short break, shorter breaks in winter, in the Februarys and the Marches when people aren't traveling in numbers. And that's an opportunity there because holidays are um, dispersed in Europe. They take them in little groups of one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. America has always been in that main holiday of the year. There's a huge market there for pushing it out as the second holiday of the year that's going to take not just the access, the air, aviation access, which is of course important, but also watching your itineraries and your price points. Uh, brilliant point. And in fact, again, with our readers, we know that September, October is um, the number one time of year they love to travel. And the number two time of year they love to travel is April and May. May is a key month. And so, yeah, don't just think about the summer and the fall, absolutely. So much opportunity. And you're absolutely right. We do tend to forget in Europe that we get a lot more holiday than uh, the rest of the world on the whole. Right, we've only got five minutes left. So um, I'm wondering if the panel's got any observations on work in the media. I think I'll come to you first, Zoe. Um, how can uh, destinations work most effectively with, with journalists? Um, any, any tips there? Yeah, um, I always think about it, I think it's really useful to think about it as a marathon and not a sprint. I think if you have a journalist and you get them on side and they really understand what your story is, then they can kind of become like a kind of unofficial ambassador for you. Um, and if that relationship works out, it can kind of be the long game that you're playing. So for example, about four years ago, I did a canoeing expedition along the Mississippi River, and it was amazing. The guy who was um, captain of the ship was called Captain Driftwood. He was a real character. It was great. So I wrote about it at the time, came back, wrote a piece for a magazine. And then four years later, a couple of weeks ago, an editor reached out and said, got any stories about slow travel in the US? 
<clears throat> and it was one, it was a story that I absolutely loved, so I kind of put it in my bag and um, re-pitched it whenever I was asked. Um, so I got it picked up again. So I think if you can kind of get a journalist to understand what your story is, then they can go back home and kind of bang the drum for you. So when I come to a conference like this, I'm obviously looking for new stories and to meet people, but I'm also, you know, in a way trying to kind of get an emotional connection and a real understanding about what your destination is, um, how I could sell it so I can go back home and kind of do that. So when it works out, a relationship with a journalist, I think it's the gift that keeps giving, hopefully over years, and you can kind of, and it works for the destination, it works for a journalist as well, because you can keep getting different stories, there's lots of different ways you can cut the cake. Exactly, and like you say, over the years and years, real drip feed. Holger, have you got any tips on working with the media? Well, first of all, I totally agree with you. I, I, I already feel as, a, as an official, have, have felt as an official ambassador, unofficial ambassador of, of some U.S. destinations, and they called me that way. So I've got a similar experience than, than you, did, uh, Zoe. Um, I, I'd say what, what is really important uh, working together with the travel trade media is uh, to consider that uh, it, the, the whole landscape has totally changed. I, when I started this, this business 25 years ago, it was PR and advertising. And that was about it. And of course, everybody tried to, to get, uh, to, to focus every destination, to try to focus on PR and said, okay, we got to have that journalist and we take him over and then he's writing a story and hey, that's good. It's, it's not very costly and it's very effective. And if there was still some money, we put it into advertising. And it has totally changed because there, was, there are so many ways to communicate into the travel trade now, uh, which, are, which, which is not advertising, which is not PR. For example, uh, working together on interactive formats, which is um, events, which is, which is live events, in-person events, which is hybrid events, which is digital events. Um, and that is something which is really, uh, which is very, very helpful to, to, to carry your message, to carry your stories into um, the German travel trade, which is still very, very important to, to sell the New England product to the consumer. And so um, I'd say it's, it's really important not just to, to focus on PR and on I know there's, there's hardly any print advertising anymore, and not, so not on, on advertising, but to think how could, we, how could we develop a kind of communication strategy together with the travel trade media house. So, and then that, I think, makes, really makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Uh, much more complex now, so many more ways to do it, but very effective ways. Um, Patricia, anything? Uh, well, I would like to say that Nowadays, less is more, uh, like uh, media. Uh, we don't want to go to uh, one destination and run. We got to see a little of this and a little of that because at the final, we doesn't have the, the real experience. So probably, like that picture, like we went to the Arizona, uh, uh, the tourists go to see the great, the great Canyon just for that picture and go. But we, we want to, to have the experience to do the room to room, go down, yeah. have a camping, talking with the people, uh, with the First Nations people, yeah. and come back. And that way you can share the story. And then after the people want to go to the Great Canyon to live the experience, not just to take the picture. Yeah. And, and that's for me. I think you have a very good opportunity if you someday you go to the mission in Mexico. I'm sure that you will find a lot of travelers because Mexicans love to come to United States, but no more to the typical destinations. And New England is a very uh, four season <coughs> destination, and yeah. I'm sure uh, uh, Mexicans will love. We'll we would love to come yeah. here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Now, Owen, you've got 30 seconds, literally. <laughs> no pressure. Journalists are very simple-minded people. They uh, just need a story and an angle. 
be clear what the story and the angle are. Don't uh, mistake a regional attraction for a national attraction. Make sure what the message you want to deliver to the audience is. That makes life easier for us and it actually makes uh, the story saleable. Thank you so much. Right, I think we are out of time, I'm afraid, so we are going to have to leave it there. But I know we'll all be around as well for the rest of the day. So do, don't be shy, do come and talk to us. That's what we're here for, to come and meet you too. And uh, thank you so much to Holger, Zoe, Jenny, Patricia and to Owen. Thanks, <laughs>